Hardware to Save a Planet explores the technical innovations that are giving us hope in the fight against climate change. Each episode focuses on a specific climate challenge and explores an emerging physical technology solution with the person bringing it into reality. I'm your host, Dylan Garrett. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Hardware to Save a Planet. Today, we're going to be talking about direct air capture, or DAC, which is a process of pulling CO2 out of ambient air. We now know that doing that on a scale of 10 billion tons per year is essential for limiting global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. We're lucky enough today to be sitting down with Noah McQueen, co-founder and head of research at Heirloom Carbon, which has a really innovative approach to DAC. Noah is not only co-founder of Heirloom, but also a leading scientist in the field of direct air capture. So welcome, Noah. Really excited to have you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to hear about Heirloom. But before we do that, I'd love our listeners to get to know you a little bit. What led you to this place where you're focused on climate change? Feel free to go back to childhood if it's relevant. What inspired you along the way? Yeah, I think... That's a great question. I've really always been motivated to use my knowledge in a way that could have a positive impact on society. And I, like many other people, didn't exactly know what that was. But it was the reason that I went into chemical engineering. So I felt like it was a way to apply like a love of math and science in a way that could have a bigger impact on society. Initially, I actually thought I was going to go into biopharmaceuticals, create life-saving medications, but I stumbled upon carbon capture specifically. And I had the opportunity to work with Professor Jennifer Wilcox, who is a pioneer in both carbon capture and direct air capture, as well as kind of the sustainable landscape more broadly. I had the opportunity to work with her in a laboratory environment, and I kind of fell in love with it. So since then, I've worked on point source carbon capture, capturing CO2 from things like power plants, direct air capture, carbon mineralization, or using minerals to capture CO2 from both the air and from point sources. And I've spanned across a a series of different fields almost, from experimentation to process design and optimization to the economics and life cycle analyses for some of these technologies, and now have been working in the field for about six years. So as time progresses and we get more of the recent reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, which is much easier to say, the urgency to deploy these technologies has become really central to me. At this point, I couldn't see myself really doing anything else. That's awesome. Yeah. Where along that path did you start to think about what heirloom carbon is doing today? How did that come about? Yeah, that's a really kind of fun story. Initially, I was working kind of on more quote unquote traditional direct air capture using solvents and sorbents and doing some of the the economic analyses for those technologies. And maybe my second year in grad school, a professor by the name of Peter Kellman approached Jen, who was then my advisor, about a tech like this process that would marry natural properties of carbon mineralization or the ways that minerals naturally take up CO2 from the atmosphere, which occurs on the orders of decades to centuries, with direct air capture, which is much more industrial technology-focused approach to removing CO2 from the air. So I was actually charged with kind of the initial process iterations. What could this look like? What should it look like? Should we use engineered systems? Should we use a passive process? And what this really allowed us to do was figure out that passive mineralization really achieves a low cost, pretty scalable process that could be used for direct air capture. Can you kind of put it in the context of direct air capture generally? So what is Heirloom doing and how does that relate to what the world of direct air capture looks like? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. So Heirloom is using naturally occurring minerals to remove CO2 directly from the atmosphere. Specifically, we use limestone. So in the current landscape for direct air capture, We typically have these technologies that you can divide into a two-by-two matrix. You've got the front end, which is how we uptake CO2, and you've got the capital and operating costs on the front end of the process. And then you've got the back end or the regeneration, which is how you produce a pure stream of CO2. And you can think of that as capital and operating costs. And where Heirloom is truly innovative is really on that front end capture part. We have low-cost, earth-abundant alkaline minerals to capture CO2. And this is different from other approaches which typically use kind of specialty engineered materials. And we don't use those materials. Instead, our two biggest contributions are limestone and steel. And those are two of the largest global commodities. So that really allows us to innovate within existing global supply chains, however strange they might be at the current moment. 
The second part of that is that we perform direct air capture passively by allowing the mineral to naturally uptake CO2. So traditional direct air capture approaches or existing direct air capture approaches use large fans to move large volumes of air through these engineered contactor systems that allow you to overcome a pressure drop. So essentially, you need it to put in a significant amount of energy to allow that air to move through your system and to properly utilize the sorbent that's inside. So we don't rely on that and we don't rely on as capitally intense structures to actually capture the CO2. So both of those bring down the capital and operating costs of that capture side of the matrix. And then finally, we're trying to design a very modular technology. And that modularity allows us to repeatedly manufacture the same process units. And we can leverage mass manufacturing and some economies of scale to really bring our technology to low cost. So I guess summarizing that, we use low cost materials. We use kind of a passive natural uptake process with our minerals. And we're also designing an incredibly modular technology that sets heirloom apart from some of the existing direct air capture approaches. Let's walk walk through the steps a little bit. So the natural inputs you have are limestone and steel. Maybe you can walk through the steps and how those two inputs are used. Yeah. Yeah. Let me take a step back and kind of provide an overview of the process that Heirloom is working on. So very high level, we use naturally available minerals, particularly limestone or calcium carbonate, to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. And in our process, that limestone is sent into a reactor And at temperatures around 900 degrees Celsius, calcium carbonate breaks apart into two parts, calcium oxide and CO2. So we can capture that CO2 in a near pure form and store that underground to keep it kind of sequestered away from the atmosphere. But the calcium oxide we've produced from that reaction is highly thirsty for CO2. We've essentially given the mineral superpowers and it wants to take out CO2 from the atmosphere. So what we can do with that is we can spread it on trays put those trays into racks and allow it to come in contact with air naturally. And in less than a week, we actually reproduce that calcium carbonate material. So we can take that calcium carbonate now and feed it back into that reactor, once again, breaking it apart into calcium oxide and CO2. And this time that CO2 that we've captured from the atmosphere is directly from the air. So we've removed CO2 from air and we can reuse that calcium oxide to capture more CO2 from the atmosphere. So it's really a cyclic process and the the inputs, the limestone is kind of the sorbent or the material that's taking the CO2 out of the air in the cyclic process. And the steel is our other main input and it provides the structure for those, the tray rack configuration that we're talking about. Gotcha. This is where I wish I had paid more attention in high school chemistry. When I was reading about this and tell me if this is a useful analogy, but it sound, I think of it as a sponge. So calcium carbonate is a sponge that has CO2 in it, you heat it up, sort of squeeze the sponge and the CO2 is separated from the calcium oxide. Absolutely. And that CO2 then you can store and inject underground. That calcium oxide is then an empty sponge, which is thirsty for the carbon dioxide again. And you can just kind of cycle, repeat this cycle, what, indefinitely? Yes, absolutely. That's a great analogy for the process. Okay. So those inputs are one-time inputs the for each of your plants, the calcium carbonate or the limestone, you mine it once or you, you extract it from the earth once and you can use it indefinitely. Yeah. Well, we're currently kind of probing what the limits of that are. We haven't cycled it indefinitely. So there may be some end threshold at which we can't use it anymore. And there may be some losses per cycle that we'll have to make up with small amounts of calcium carbonate. But for the most part, it is, it's highly cyclable and we have, we're optimistic that we can do dozens, if not hundreds of cycles with the same material. And I should say there's an awesome white paper that you've shared with me, and we'll put a link in the show notes because it has some really clear diagrams that visualize what we're talking about. Yeah. It's a tough topic for podcasting, Yeah, but yeah, those visuals are really helpful. So the other thing I understand about this is, so this is a natural process that occurs naturally, but you've found a way to, to speed it up. Is that right? We have, yeah. Can you talk about how you speed it up? Yeah, it is one of our key technical challenges. Maintaining the high CO2 uptake rate through our material, that's how we give it superpowers. And it's kind of like the bread and butter of what our process is on the carbonation side. So we combine geochemistry with the knowledge of equipment design and industrial automation and bring all of those components together to control how these minerals take up CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's one of like our key factors in achieving that low cost. So yeah, (laughs) it's a little bit of bread and butter, and we'll talk about it hopefully later this year. Yeah, cool. 
But the punchline is you are this natural process that typically takes what months, years is sped up to the time scale of what is it, days? Days. Yeah. We're we're on the order of kind of like three to seven days for any given conditions. So that's a great overview of what Heirloom is doing and kind of how it compares to other DAC companies. I'm curious if when you look at this kind of whole carbon removal marketplace, how do you view these other companies doing direct air capture? Do you see them as competition? Is there enough CO2 to go around and it's sort of all hands on deck kind of situation? How do you look at that? Yeah, I really do think that we're going to need a portfolio of different solutions in order to truly achieve our climate goals. As you mentioned in the beginning, 10 billion tons of carbon removal is nothing to scoff at. It's building, I believe I've heard an analogy that it's like building the oil and gas industry over 10 times in the next decade. And that's a lot of infrastructure. That's a lot of innovation. That's a lot of movement of CO2, both in the atmosphere and in processes that we're going to have to manage. And I think, I hope everyone is successful. I, I don't view it so much as competitively as I do that we're going to need a lot of different solutions in order to actually be successful. I do think that a handful of companies will come, a handful of highly scalable, potentially low cost companies will come out as forerunners in the field of direct air capture. But overall, we need as many shots on goal as we can get. It's just what climate needs to. You mentioned cost. What does the cost side of things look like for heirloom? We definitely think we have a, a pathway to under $100 per ton of CO2 with a target of under $50 per ton of CO2. It's that two by two matrix that I was talking about where we've really brought down the cost on the capture side of things, both capital and operating, and are working on bringing down the costs on the back end regeneration side as well, both capital and operating. So we think that with increasing scale, as well as optimizations inside of our process, we can really achieve that. And of course, continued investment in research and development. So that makes you actually at that level, you're cost competitive with, and check me on this, but my understanding is a lot of other permanent removal options, offset options are on the order of hundreds or low thousands of dollars per ton. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And All of these technologies are still up and coming too. So we're one of the facets I mentioned earlier is modularity, which will hopefully allow us to come down in cost faster than some other approaches. Can you talk about that modularity? What does that look like? Yeah, I think when I talk about modularity, it's really a couple of different things. The first one is how you design a process to be repeatedly manufactured. So modularity in kind of its core refers to the ability for a technology to be partitioned into smaller smaller pieces, essentially. And what it enables is mass manufacturing. It opens up a a realm of repeated improvements. So when you're making something over and over and over again, you can quickly iterate over what you're making to make it better each time you do an iteration. So modularity not only enables that quick iteration, but also enables you to repeatedly stamp out the same part over and over and over again. And that allows you to come down the cost curve much quicker. So Technologies that exhibit modularity typically also exhibit higher learning rates in kind of the framework of Wright's law. So we saw this for solar is a good example, as well as certain other types of technologies. But other types of systems for carbon removal, specifically direct air capture, you see that they're massive and they've got a lot of interconnectivity and touch points between different aspects of the process. So one of the key aspects of what we're trying to design is minimizing that complexity and trying to create this highly scalable system that exhibits more of that component by component modularity. Hopefully that was clear. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, great answer. So you talk about modularity as being really important to come down that cost curve. What are some other major barriers in getting there as you scale? It's a really interesting question. I think that there are one of the other key factors of achieving low cost is the amount of energy. So you can think of the absolute floor for the cost of a carbon removal system as the energy input, since that is most of the operating cost. Capital cost, you can kind of annualize away essentially over long periods of time and operation, but the energy requirements are there and and steadfastly there. So one challenge that is uniform across a lot of direct all direct air capture approaches is that removing CO2 from the atmosphere is energetically unfavorable. That means you have a large energy requirement just to separate CO2 from a very, very dilute stream. So in air, CO2 makes up about 400 parts per million. And in 
comparison coming out of a flue gas stack from an energy production facility, say natural gas, it's about 4 to 6%. So it's orders of magnitude more dilute in air than you get from some of these point sources. So that inherently means that we require significantly more energy into the process based on thermodynamic limits. So for us, pushing our process closer to those thermodynamic limits creates a more energy efficient direct air capture system and pushes us closer towards those $50 to $100 per ton target. We also plan to use renewable energy. So we actually believe that the cost curves of renewable energy will continue to make our techno-economics work, even in more conservative cases where the projections for the cost of renewable energy stay a bit higher than those, those minimum projections. I'm just thinking scaling to a billion tons. What about are things like land availability become a challenge or the injection sites for storing the CO2? Yeah. So for direct air capture, land use is actually a pro of direct air capture as a method to take CO2 out of the atmosphere because it requires so much less land than things like afforestation or reforestation or purpose-grown biomass or crops that intentionally take CO2 out of the air. So land availability isn't necessarily an issue for direct air capture. When it comes to injection, there are abundant places to put the CO2 underground. So in North America alone, we have the capacity to store hundreds of billions of tons of CO2. Wow. And that is characterized geology. You can put CO2 in a lot of different places. So there's sedimentary basins, which held oil and gas for tens of millions of years, where we can put the CO2 back underground. There's also other types of minerals, such as basalts, where if you inject CO2 in water, you can actually mineralize the CO2 underground. And that's company like CarbFix are looking into that. And I think that the joint capacity globally is more than enough than what we need for direct air capture specifically, and including point source capture from some continued emitters that we can actually capture the CO2 from. What about the demand side of things? Is the demand scaling fast enough to meet these targets? Yeah. The demand for carbon offsets? Yeah. Demand is a really interesting piece of it. So when you think about the current market, what we see is that It's dominated by voluntary carbon markets. And that means there's companies like Stripe and Shopify and Klarna that are actually paying for carbon removal that will decarbonize their operations and supply chain. These companies are willing to pay a higher price for carbon removal. And that will allow us to push technologies down that learning curve and start deploying. But I guess currently, that demand is vastly outpacing the supply of high quality carbon removal. Gotcha. So right, we have the opposite problem. We have the fact that people are looking for more high quality carbon removal than we can actually supply. Although at some point we'll need additional incentives aside from that voluntary market in order to reach the billion ton scale removal. So these voluntary carbon markets will get us to the millions of tons, tens of millions of tons, but we'll need compliance markets or mandatory carbon markets policy, essentially, to meet those voluntary markets and help push us to a billion tons of carbon removal, which is really where we need to be from a climate impact perspective. Last question on the topic of scaling, just because I think it's so a billion tons is such such a big number, right? Or 10 billion tons. It really is. Are there other knock-on effects you need to be thinking about as you're building a company like Heirloom? How will all the plants you need to build impact the communities they're in or What about the effects of the mining for the materials you need? Or is there anything like that you think about? Yeah, absolutely. It's at the forefront of a lot of what we're thinking about, actually. We have a lot of stakeholders in our process. And for us, a lot of those are frontline communities, those most affected by the climate crisis, as well as where the technology will be deployed. And it's incredibly important to us that we gain enthusiastic consent and support from communities. So I would say that's definitely something that is at the forefront of our minds. So where is Heirloom today in terms of this journey? Where in the sort of evolution of the company and the technology are you? Yeah, so we have scaled prototypes and we're working on putting out our first plants in early next year. So we're really excited to be able to go to more of the commercial scale and hopefully get that to deployment early 2023. Do you have a, a sort of a pilot system that's currently capturing, that's currently doing direct air capture today? Yeah, we have a pilot system that's currently capturing CO2 and we'll have uh, deliver... (laughs) Our target is to deliver our first tons by the end of this year. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Exciting. Because I think I saw you have a purchase agreement with Stripe already, right? Yeah. And some other customers. Yeah, we have a couple. Stripe, Shopify, Klarna, Sourceful. 
we're, we're super excited to be working with these companies as they go on their sustainability journeys. This is maybe a silly question, but it makes me wonder, you're building this company that's taking all this CO2 out of the air. Do you have any guilty climate pleasures where it's like, I'm just going to take an extra long hot shower because I know that I'm out there saving the planet or like, I'm going to have all my beef flown in from Kobe just because <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going to... True. Yeah. No, I actually, I do personally try to live what I preach to an extent. Like I don't really eat meat. I try not to have a significant energy footprint. I'm very conscious, but I'm sure there's ways in which I'm failing. I'm sure just like by living in San Francisco, California, I'm failing a little bit from a carbon footprint perspective and that there's more I could be doing, but maybe not a guilty pleasure per se, but I do know that I probably have a bigger footprint than most. <laughs> Well, it must be satisfying knowing you have such an outsized impact by building this company. Yeah, I hope so. So I'd love to go a little bit deeper into the tech. You've touched on it a little bit, but can you talk a little bit about what this sort of just physically looks like? Yeah. So in our process, we have the capture portion. So the capture portion looks... You can think of them as giant cafeteria racks. It literally is is vertical structures that have trays situated on shelves. And what that enables us to do is expose a higher surface area of our materials. We can expose more more area of material per land area. And it saves on a lot of those land area requirements that we were talking about earlier. It allows us to have a much more minimal footprint. So you can imagine giant cafeteria racks, and then we have powder inside of trays. Now that's our capture system. Our regeneration system, you can envision that there's maybe 50 to 100 of these giant cafeteria racks and they're hooked up to a single reactor and that reactor just looks like a tube in a lot of cases. So it is either, yeah, it kind of looks like a tube and that is heated and the material is fed in. So from an outsider perspective, you see this array of trays and racks and probably nothing else to be completely honest. We do hope that we can integrate renewable electricity into this. So maybe you see a roof of solar panels essentially over our facility, but Yeah, we really do hope that this is something where you can look out and it's beautiful both because of what it's doing and because it's visually appealing. And at least the collection part of it is totally silent. It sounds like there's no fans. There's no kind of, yeah, it's sitting there just ambiently collecting or silently collecting the ambient air. Is that right? Yeah, to to an extent. We do occasionally process the material, but it's not like noise pollution. It's very, it's quiet compared to, especially compared to other industrial processes. Mm -hmm. And this is a detailed question, but does the powder expand as it absorbs the CO2? Yeah, there's a little bit of an expansion because you get a density change in the material. So calcium oxide is more dense than calcium carbonate. So there's a little bit, but it's pretty negligible. Gotcha. And where in all this is there any hardware innovation happening, if any? Yeah, I would say a lot of our entire contactor structure is really hardware innovation. That's kind of focus of what we've been developing. And a lot of that hardware is new, it's innovative, it's something that hasn't been used for this application before being redesigned and re-envisioned for direct air capture. So we have from the way that we expose the material to air to designing those trays and racks, we have an incredible amount of hardware innovation going on behind the scenes. I'd be curious to hear about the modularity piece. So it's when I hear that, I understand you have the collection side and the regeneration side. Those are separate systems, which gives you some level of modularity because they're not really interconnected. Yeah. You probably have sort of physical modularity in the sense that you can stack. You could just go as high as you want, potentially, with your stacks of trays. What other aspects of the modularity I'm not thinking of? There's several different degrees of modularity. So we can repeatedly manufacture the trays that make up holding our material. And we can also repeatedly manufacture the physical contactors that those trays sit in. So the pieces, parts of those contactors from the way that we hold the trays inside of the contactor to the physical structure of the contactor. And all of that is requiring and does require a significant amount of innovation in how you think about what are the components that make up the system and how can we make them as repeatable as possible. So some of this is designing for manufacturability. Some of this is designing for ease of on-site build. And all of that is kind of wrapped up in this modularity that we're referring to. So I think you nailed a lot of it. And it's even more, it runs even deeper than just the physical design of the equipment. 
Sometimes the biggest hardware challenge is just taking something that's working one time in the lab and scaling it to work thousands of times or hundreds of thousands of times in a real world. Yeah. I think that's a great example too, because we have a process that works in the lab and we're making it work in the real world. And that in itself requires innovation and iteration and a deep understanding of how process plays with equipment. And that's something that we've gotten a much better grasp on as we've continued to develop. Is the cost of the equipment itself a big driver of your total sort of cost per ton? Like, is there a lot of effort to sort of cost reduce the physical plants? Or is that not as, is it more about the operation costs? I would say energy is one of the biggest drivers. So we are fairly focused on that between not having fans on the front end of our process and really being able to almost eliminate energy requirements there to focusing on how we can minimize energy requirements on the back end. But there's always a push to decrease the capital cost of the systems because that's what you've got to finance. And, and to some extent, like the lower we can bring the costs on from the capital perspective, the easier financing terms we'll get, it, especially in the near term until we have a little bit more dedicated infrastructure as to how we actually finance carbon removal as an ecosystem, which is a whole nother discussion. Yeah. Is it worth touching on the financing side for a minute, just because it's so critical to scaling? Yeah, we're welcome to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious what that looks like. I know you closed a Series A recently. Yeah, we have wonderful investors, to say, say the least. And we did just close our Series A led by Aaron Innovation Capital, Carbon Direct, and Breakthrough Energy Ventures. And so that is a lot of pushing us towards our first deployment. But as we we start to gain traction and actually scale, we need other financing mechanisms that can push us to larger and larger scales, including things like debt financing and probably governmental grants and loans at low interest rates that actually allow us to deploy this. So you can think of it similar to public utilities. And that's all infrastructure that doesn't necessarily exist today that will need to be built out to actually sustain some of these technologies as they do scale. And the hope is that those infrastructure would come in place as the scaling takes place over the next couple of years. So speaking of scale, and we've hit this a little bit, but you have, I've seen on your website, Heirloom has a target of removing a billion tons of CO2 by 2035. Yeah. So that's in about 13 years. You're launching your first plant next year. What Do you have a sense of what kind of capacity, removal capacity a single plant will have? That's a great question. We're still figuring it out because it really is defined by our regeneration system, but we anticipate tens of thousands of tons of CO2 being removed. So it's a huge, very steep curve to get there, right? Yeah. I'm curious, how, how do you wrap your head around that? How does that challenge make you feel as somebody leading this company? I'm realistically optimistic. I think we have a really, really good chance at having a huge impact on climate. And the way we really think about our deployments is A single module of our technology would be tens of thousands of tons of CO2, but that's one seed at a given site. So we can have an initial deployment that allows us to get permitting completed, find an injection partner, get renewable energy set up, and then we can continue to develop that site until it's at millions, if not tens of millions of tons. We're still figuring out what the limit would be for a particular site, but it allows us to build it out incrementally and do that at multiple locations. And that will enable us to scale much faster than if we were building giant plants in one location and then moving on for another plant in another location. So I'm really optimistic about our technology and our ability to deploy and scale. And I think that that approach specifically to deployment will also make us generally more successful because we can cultivate plants in parallel almost and continue deploying at sites we've already set up for deployment. So I hate optimistic. <laughs> One of our values is persistent optimism. And I like to think that that we're all optimistic that we can make this big difference on climate. Nice. Living the values. Yeah. So in that time frame, 10, 13 years, what do you think, what do you hope heirloom carbon will look like as a company? It's a great question. I feel like there are so many different facets to this. And it's really interesting to think about just based on how fast we've been growing. I really imagine from more of a technology perspective that we have deployed across the US. We have several sites. You can drive across the plains and you can see one of our outdoor facilities operating in this autonomous fashion, removing CO2 from the atmosphere without you knowing. And coupled to these really impressive renewable energy facilities and truly beautiful to see, especially if you know what's going on like behind the curtain. 
And then on the heirloom side, we encounter with the number of tons of CO2 we've removed from the atmosphere. We've grown to be this a massively interdisciplinary and intercultural company that is deploying and has deployed tens of millions of tons of CO2 removal. We're constructing plants around the US and, and around the world that will enable further deployments. And we're really working towards fulfilling those global climate goals. I think that when I think about the future, that's kind of what it looks like from a physical perspective. And it really does inspire me because I think that the scale of the problem can be very daunting. And thinking about what the solutions can look like is not something that everyone is doing. So that kind of visualization, it brings me joy. I hope it brings others joy. Yeah, it does help. It's a yeah, beautiful future. A few last questions. On a scale of, we totally got this to the sky is falling. What's your perspective on the future of our planet? Is a, a one, we totally got this, and a 10, the sky is falling? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or the other, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, probably a three. Like I mentioned, I'm realistically optimistic about the future of our planet. Both We need to both reduce our carbon emissions, which I think where we're taking strides to do, as well as like remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And it's no easy feat to do so, but we've got like incredibly talented, smart and capable, and most importantly, motivated individuals that are working on this. So I'm really optimistic there. That said, I think we do need a little bit more from the global scale and how we would integrate a global economy to address the climate crisis that I think is kind of lacking. So I have local, state, and federal governments across the globe do more than thinking about how we actually implement this. And I think that some are, and we need action too. So I think that it's a healthy balance of persistent optimism and realism. How about you? I want to flip that question. I, I'm super interested. How do you think about on a scale of we got this to the sky is falling? Ooh, great question. I love this. The more I do this podcast and the more people I talk to, the more I lean towards the we got this. Yeah. But it's more like you guys got this. I'm just doing a podcast here. But I, yeah, I'm really impressed by the number of people entering this industry from all corners of the world and how passionate and motivated and smart you are and your peers are. And it does give me some confidence. That's good to hear. That we got this. Yeah. <laughs> but that's one of the reasons I ask yeah. to make sure my head's in the right spot. <laughs> yeah. Who is one other person or company doing something to address climate change that's inspiring you right now? Choosing just one is going to be really hard. <laughs> oh, as many as you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people in this space that are doing great things. I think it's probably a bit cheesy for me to say this, but perhaps Jennifer Wilcox, she's my advisor, but she's also a professor at the University of Pennsylvania who's on leave as a very long title, President, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. Quite a mouthful. What does that mean? <laughs> she oversees as she is currently the appointed Assistant Secretary of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management until someone is confirmed into the position of Assistant Secretary of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. So she's overseeing that entire part of the DOE. And she's really someone who like conveys and articulates really complex concepts in a way that's totally digestible and understandable to a broad audience. I really respect that. And she's really motivated by creating the next generation of human capital to solve the climate crisis. And I think that that type of motivation is crucial to what we need in order to get us to the next steps of technology development, of policy development, of really like combating climate change. And in addition to all of that, she's currently pushing the Department of Energy or Fossil Energy and Carbon Management to its limit. She worked to change the name from Fossil Energy to Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. And I think that she's just enacted such crucial change at the governmental level that is, it's truly admirable. If I can say more than one, I'm also inspired by a lot of the work Please. of Carbon Direct. <laughs> Carbon Direct actually was an investor in Heirloom, but they've worked with many of the big names in the voluntary carbon markets to kind of set up the framework for what defines high quality carbon removal, which is an absolutely crucial aspect of developing these markets. And I, I think they, they've just got such a smart and talented team and just have provided so many resources to actually educate as well as influence how we think about carbon removal in these voluntary markets. So I think the work that they're doing is incredibly impactful as well. And what's their main business model? We have, uh, it's two different companies. Uh, carbon Direct 
has a science advisory side where they actually advise clients on picking projects for or setting up requests for proposals for carbon removal projects, as well as sifting through those as to how you actually come up with high quality carbon removal, as well as advising a little bit more broadly as to strategy and strategic decisions related to carbon removal, as well as they've got a capital management side that is is separate and does investing in the space of carbon capture, carbon removal, and general carbon management. Pretty cool. Yeah. One thing I've been realizing is how much a carbon credit is not all carbon credits are created equal. Not at all. (laughs) And how important it is that that's well understood by the demand side of all this. Yeah. And that's a really crucial part of what Carbon Direct is doing is making sure that the demand side understands, is the project additional? Is it taking CO2 that wouldn't have otherwise been removed from the atmosphere? And how long is it keeping that CO2 away from the atmosphere? And what are the other externalities of that process that needs to be considered? And There's a a long list of what constitutes high quality carbon removal. What advice do you have for someone that's new to the industry, but wants to do something to help? It's also a really good question. I think there's so much in this and there's really a place for everyone in climate tech. There's so many companies that just came out of the woodwork that have started development on climate technologies, be it direct air capture, be it other forms of carbon removal. So I think that my advice for people getting started is to learn more about what's out there. Find something that in climate tech that really motivates you to get involved and then reflect on what you're interested in, what facets of climate technology actually speak to you on a personal level and what would you be excited to get out of bed every day and work on and then pursue that. That's where your interest lies. That's what you're passionate about. That's what you can pursue. And we're really at the cusp of a burgeoning field. There's really no shortage of opportunities. And maybe if you allow me one last kind of shameless plug here is that if you're interested in the technology that I've been talking about, Heirloom has several open positions. We're building out a team that cares deeply about the climate. And I think that there's so many opportunities for creativity and innovation in what we're doing that we really want to bring on people who share that mission and share our values of radical honesty, persistent optimism, and really maximizing our ability to learn. So I'll shamelessly plug Heirloom there. (laughs) Please do. Yeah, I love it. That's one of the goals of doing this show. And we'll put a link in the show notes so people have an easy way to get there to your listings. Awesome. Well, Noah, that's a great call to action to end on and inspiring. I really appreciate your time today and everything you're doing to address climate change. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hardware to Save a Planet is brought to you by Synapse. To find out more about us and how we develop hardware solutions for the world's most ambitious companies, head to synapse.com. And then make sure to search for Hardware to Save a Planet in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere you like to listen. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Synapse, thanks for listening.